Are we hearing music? Hey everybody, welcome to episode 87 of the Gene Pool Variety Hour again. Uh, I'm Sean, I'm the old guy, I'm the host of the group. Uh, the guy in the bottom corner of the stream is is Connor, that's my, my son. And we also have a guest now, and, and our guest is... TV's Travis. There you go. So TV's Travis is joining us, and Connor, I'm sorry I didn't get you, give you a chance to talk, so jump right in and do your thing. This unit is known as Quillmeister. We, this unit welcomes TV's Travis. It, for those that are just listening uh, to the audio podcast, if you're on, if you were here on the video stream, Connor is what we call Locutus of Borg. If he was ordered on Wish, uh, with what he's wearing on his face right now, so um, just imagine that image, and and that's Connor. So anyway, this unit is wearing its crafting goggles. <laughs> So Respect we've been the drip. <laughs> Again, I Travis, you just you just it, it's like a roller coaster. You just grab and hold on and just hope you don't get thrown out of the cart. So um all so, I can hope for. <laughs> so anyway. So we've been gone. We, we 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 tried to start back a couple of weeks ago. We've had these audio issues. I've had so much help from Travis and from Groove. I've had so much help getting this stuff, and we, I think we may have finally got the last piece fixed just a while ago. So um, we're back. We, uh, we just hang out and talk about nerdy stuff. Uh, Connor and I are the nerds of the family. We've done this for years. Um, and the episodes are just... What's that? My family has since expanded yeah, you're into fit. more nerds. Right. So uh, we talk about random movies. Uh, we rolled and chose a random, random movie we're going to talk about tonight. And we're trying a new segment tonight that we've never done before. So it could be fun Ooh. or it could be a train wreck. Um, we'll let y'all decide. Um, I will add background music in post because I, no <laughs> I have no idea where this story is going to go. So I'm going to try to find some music to match whatever the story ends up being. Because this, the new segment we're doing is something called Ever-Changing Story where we're going to just make up a story on the fly uh, using dice and just just go and see what happens. I used to do this with Connor and his brothers when they were little. I'd make up bedtime stories for them, just ad-lib it as I went, and we decided to make it a segment. So there you go. Can I, um, can I say my favorite one, Dad? Which one? Um, it, um, it, it would have to be the um, Scotty the Diarrhea Squirrel. Well, there was that one, then there was the farting <laughs> bear. Then there's, yeah. Th th I mean, I have questions, <laughs> but I kind of don't want answers to them at the same time. So I'll, these stories always ended up being super gross because I had a little boy, so I made gross bedtime stories, but they always ended I mean, up having a fair. moral at the end. And so, um, yeah, there was the squirrel that had diarrhea. There was the bear that farted uh, i can't remember what some of the other ones were somebody told me i needed to always write these down and i um, never did so i don't remember the stories um, but. oh another good one was um was was the monkey bank uh. security officer who um who had chronic um allergies and, and stopped a bank robber by sneezing on them and getting getting the money they stole all sticky with snot they, yeah that yeah that was snotty mucus that was his name snotty mucus yeah yeah so so anyway, so that, so that gives you a flavor of the kind of stories I used to tell my kids. <laughs> no wonder they turned out the way they did. Um, so anyway, um, but Travis, we appreciate you coming on. So what made you decide to be willing to well, come on with us? Uh, I mean, I would say the largest reason is that I have an inability to say no when asked to be on oh, a show. Gotcha. Um, there you go. So if somebody asks me to be on a show, I'm like, yeah, sure. All uh, right. It's very rare that I say no. I have a problem. Not gonna happen um, no, it, it, honestly, you were talking about wanting to start this back up. And and I definitely, you know, I love the idea of, uh, of you know, small, small shows, getting going, just hanging out, talking. And then you mentioned the story cubes and kind of making up a story as we went along and talking about a movie. And that's, I don't know. And, and talking about movies, talking about movies is what I do. 
I was about to say, yeah, that's that's your gig. That's your thing, right? That's my thing. And the story cube idea was kind of fun because, like, you know, get to maybe stretch out and use some of my improv muscles that I haven't used in in a long time. There you go. Um, So, yeah, it just sounded like fun. Uh, So that coupled with my inability to say no, and I'm here. And you were wise not to mention the farting farting bears or diarrhea squirrels until I got here. (laughs) So now I'm stuck and I can't get away. And... (laughs) Well, we're gonna see what happens. Uh, you're gonna end up with like a quicksand. We got a Wolverine with Crohn's disease or yeah. something in this story. <laughs> we're gonna see where this thing goes. Uh, we we usually never know where it's gonna go. Connor takes us <laughs> in dark places of the internet sometimes. Who knows? Um, Connor usually yeah. starts us off with a question. Do you have some kind of question for us this time? Um, me? Yeah, you're Travis. You? Okay, I said you. You always have a question. You're the random Let's guy. See. Random question guy. Let's see. My question is, so it's it's so recently I've been I've been doing a a full chronological binge of um of of all the DCCW shows, you know, Arrow, okay. Flash, Supergirl, Legends. Um, um, I'll even get in getting into Black Lightning. Even the even the first season is very political. It, it's supposed to get better in, in season <laughs> two. Um. Um, so my question is specifically about the Flash. So, the Flash has super speed. We all know this. You know he he can do things fast. He can run fast. You know he's just fast. But there are several scenes throughout the series where where he does things that don't, that don't really make sense with his speed. Like for example, he uses power tools and, and can fix things at super speeds. He himself is fast, but the thing he's holding. It's still running at its normal operating speed. So, so how, how is he able to do all of this super speed repairing stuff if his tools are just, are just regular power tools? I'm um, saying um, same, same thing with phones. He's um, he, he he's able to take like a hundred pictures in ten seconds with um with a smartphone, but a smartphone can only operate and register so much in such a little time. But he's able to do all that. So. So, so did they soup him up with a super speedy smartphone or, or what? So that's what's gotten me confused, and that's what I want to ask. What do you think <sighs> happens with that? Sean, you want to take this one or? Uh... <laughs> most my dad never has an answer. Most of my aunt, most of my confounded by the compounds of my brain. Most of my answers to Connor's questions are, I don't know, Google it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's well, so, always you know, been that I, way. <laughs> so so I can I can give you some some theories here, okay? Sure. All right. Number one, uh, he works for Star Labs, mm-hmm. and Star Labs is effectively a uh, a plot device to give him whatever he needs. Okay. Um, so sense. there's that. So he could have he could have tools that work faster. He could sure. not be using the power part of the power tool and just turning it turning things himself or sawing things himself. That could be a thing. But also you have to remember he has the ultimate speed plot armor, which is the speed force. He is able to pull things into or imbue things with the speed force. Okay, and that I can include can his tools. That. So that okay. would be that would be mine. That that's my answer. Is uh, the all all encompassing speed force? Yeah. Um, I, I still I still love the show Arrow. Oh, my dad gave up on it after season three. Uh, Arrow? Oh, no, no. No, 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 I watched all of Arrow. Flash, Flash yeah. I gave up on Flash. I gave up on Flash. No, you I, you, I got you even gave up on Arrow. You even gave up on Arrow. The last season I did. Last season, season and a half I did. It got, yeah, it was, started getting a little it, stale. But but it was the best one of all of them, in my opinion. But No, Flash was followed by Supergirl and then Arrow and then all the others. I'm sorry, but you're categorically wrong there. The best of the series was Legends of Tomorrow, followed by Supergirl, followed by Flash. <laughs> okay. And I say that because Legends of Tomorrow just didn't care. You're like, nope, we're off on our own, traveling through time. You want something weird to go on? We'll we'll go with that. Mick Rory's going to be a romance, writing trashy romance novels. Boom, done. Give me some of that. Like they just they just said. We're going to take the D list of like, we're going to take DC characters you have never heard of before, and we're going to make them the focus of a show, and it's going to be fantastic. Supergirl was un- unreasonably good. I, I and agree. I love the Flash starting. The Flash started off so great. The problem was yeah. that it ended up retreading a lot. Yeah. yeah. You can only yeah. have so many times where. 
for for somebody for a superhero who has a rogues gallery like the flash that literally has a name they call them the rogues yeah but the big bad every i think out of nine seasons the big bad for like seven of them is another speedster oh yeah there was there was thawne zoom godspeed savitar um um thawne again thawne a third time um yeah when, when in doubt go with thawne e- um even though his whole thing doesn't make sense because because Eddie Thon took him completely out of the timeline, and and then they basically just retconned him in after after season two when Barry somehow took him back out of the timeline, and then he just well never got caught up to. You, you've read comics before, right? Like um, any I, comics? Um, not many. Just, just... No. Okay, so um, I want to. don't get me wrong. The, the thing with comic books is. No, don't apply any logic to them whatsoever because all they're going to do is retcon it especially dc who has re um has collapsed down and retconned their entire universe multiple times That's there's true. actually like pre-crisis and post-crisis origin stories for all of your major characters yeah and all of their side characters because dc at one point was like we have way too much spaghetti going on we're just going to consolidate it all we have one epic crossover and everything's going to be fine going forward. And that lasted for 15 years. And then they did it again. They just have to keep rebooting it because it's comic books. Yeah. Marvel oh. was just like, whatever. We just got all this crap going on. <laughs> what? Um, um, uh, um, I've said this a lot about, about, about these two franchises, DC and Marvel. Um, for, for, from my experience, Marvel makes better movies, but DC ha- has better TV shows, you know? Um, that's, for the that's most part they have experience um i would say overall yes marvel hasn't done as many tv series right you know agents um, of shield was was pretty good agents of shield was great for its first couple of seasons I'd, especially i loved agents of shield yeah. bringing in colson and, and, and everything um, um um with with marvel most most of their tv shows have been spider-man themed have you noticed that mm. like like well, like, now, I are we talking mean, like, live action or animation? Because animation-wise, DC blows them out of the water. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. Oh, oh yeah. Because they had oh, Bruce they Tim, had... and then eventually, and Paul Dini, and all those guys starting with Batman the Animated Series, and they just went through, and all of that DC animation stuff is just, I mean, just, mwah, chef's kiss. Like, it's yeah. great. One, one of my favorite <clears throat> um, DC animated series that, that I feel is underrated was Static Shock. Static Shock was really good. It's right. Um, it was um, it was comical. It um, it, um, it um, it it was political without shoving it in your face. It um, it um, it was like a perfect combination of of after school special and actual superhero action. You know, I I loved watching it growing up. Yeah, um, Static Shock was really good. Batman Beyond. If oh, you haven't watched mm-hmm. that. Batman mm-hmm. Beyond. Beyond is so good. I loved that one. Yeah, See, oh. I grew up. I grew up with Batman the Animated Series. It started on Fox Afternoons when I was in elementary school. I was the perfect age for it. I had just seen Batman 89. Within a year or two, Batman the Animated Series starts. Mm -hmm. And so I was in on all of that. I was watching Batman the Animated Series every day. And then eventually Superman, Adventures of Superman. And that all rolled into Justice League. But you also had Batman Beyond, Static Shock. Then you got Justice League. Then they went to Justice League Unlimited and really opened it up. Oh yeah, I love Justice League Unlimited. Um, what um, what, what was your opinion on Teen Titans? Which version? Because there's the um, two different versions of it, and um, I more I remember the the first version more. Teen Titans, not Teen Titans Go. Oh, I hate um, Teen Titans Go. Um, all comedy, no substance, no way. I, um. I know Cartoon Network um, thrives on comedy-based shows, but if you go back about ten years, they had shows that had good, like had good storytelling and good action, but also were funny, kind of like um, just like the original Teen Titans, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it, Go what? has its place, but I, I preferred the Teen Titans series. But that's what I watched more. And yeah, Sean, you just like uh, oh no, I this is landing. No, 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 no. I'm just sitting here. I'm just. I was, I was just sitting here going, no, no, no. It was co- completely chicken stuff because we started with one. This is Connor. We started with one thing and we chased the chicken somewhere completely else. And I was going to take it even further as you guys were talking about. And you mentioned Batman Beyond. 
there's a podcast out there called The Arkham Sessions. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. There's a psychologist. Her name is uh, yeah, 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 Andrea Let- Letamendi. She's taken. She's a psychologist, and I've met her before. Um, and she's taken uh, Batman the Animated Series, and she's gone. Ep- each ep- each podcast episode is an episode of the of the show where they go in and they they break up break down the psychological makeup, the psychological trauma, and all that kind of stuff of all the characters through that show. Um, and they, they've gotten through all the so they're like episode 205 so they're doing other things now but that's where they started oh, awesome. so yeah so it's pretty fascinating so I, I want to say one last thing about Batman the animated series is that Remember? that series treated its audience with respect in terms of storytelling it was not afraid to have dark themes and dark stories because they understood that it's sort of like Jim Henson talked about this a lot too, where it's it's not a bad thing to scare kids every once in a while. Mm-hmm. You, you don't you don't want to overdo it like anything, but kids should get scared every so often. That's what makes you know uh, the Dark Crystal uh, work. Like Henson knew this, um, Don Bluth knew this. Mm-hmm. If you watch old Don Bluth stuff, Land Before Time, Secret of Nim. Uh, American Tale, all of those. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. And Batman the Animated Series was able to give... I mean, the the whole character of Harvey Dent and Two-Face, it's right. a great mm-hmm. uh, a great arc. You got yep. the Joker, who is both funny and absolutely terrifying. Yep. Mark Hamill's yeah. Joker hits all those notes. Yep. And you had a series that, was, that, that, that treated its audience with respect, uh, even though it knew its target audience was kids. And was so good that they incorporated elements of Batman the Animated Series into the can- comics canon. Wow. I mean, Harley Quinn, Harley Quinn was created as a one-off for Batman the Animated Series. But she was so popular in that that they brought her back and eventually worked her into the comics. That's that's wild. Um, I, I had no idea that that was the case. Such an amazing there was that, character. And it was also, too. yeah, and it was also, I think it was Mr. Freeze's backstory um, of the whole like Nora Freeze and being frozen and having the, the, uh, the, what most people consider to be like the Mr. Freeze backstory, I'm pretty sure was from uh, the, the episode Heart series. of Ice yeah. from, from the animated series. Cause before I that, he was just a dude that, that, uh, that stole things and they gave him this tragic backstory. Right. So like Paul Dini and, and Bruce Tim knew what they were doing. So, Mr. Yeah. Freeze, in my opinion, is is one of the few Batman villains that I feel like could actually be fully redeemed into being either either a normal citizen or 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 some kind of redemption arc to be an actual hero. He um because his thing was never about causing chaos or anything. It's um it, it was it was a psychosis caused by his condition and and was also fuel, fueled by his grief and depression with his wife. You know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so he's a very. I, he became a very tragic, tragic villain, tragic character because of that, and that's that's all down to Batman the animated series. Like they yeah, yeah. they yeah. went that route with it. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, I'm, if y'all yeah. want, if y'all want to keep talking, keep talking. I just <laughs> um, the 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 camera over here is dying. I've got to get it plugged up. It, it's not charging okay. like it's supposed to be. So I'm going to go get a charger for it. So y'all can all talk. Right. I'll be right back. So do you have um, do you have a up? favorite? DC animated series like um, overall because there's a ton of them and there's there's some that I have like I've only watched sparingly things like Batman the Brave and the Bold which Brave, is really fun because Brave and the Bold takes me back to Batman 66 and the old yeah. Adam West series and it's got my favorite version of Aquaman ever is in Brave and the Bold. <laughs> I um, love Brave and Bold's version of Aquaman. He was basically just just a a full on Chad, just under, just trying to just trying to impress everybody. Yeah, it was freaking hilarious. but like it, you know, I only watched a few episodes of that. Or the Batman was another one that tried to do something a little bit different, yeah. but I didn't watch a ton of it. It kind of came out in a period where I wasn't able to see as much. Yeah. So I kind of I tend to lean towards the older '90s to early 2000s era stuff. But do you have? Do you have a series that really stands out for you? Uh, um, um, it would have to be. Um, it's honestly a kind of three-way tie between Batman Beyond, the original Teen Titans, and um, and, and then then the recent show called Young Justice. Young Justice was really good. It yeah. is so good, and I love how um, 
a very underrated. The characters, the the buildup of everything. Oh my gosh, that that is a Gordon Ramsay level chef's kiss, you know. <laughs> oh, a beef really... Wellington level chef's kiss. Also, a underrated version of the Joker, done by Brent Spiner. I mean, he's not Mark Hamill, but he's a good good version of the Joker. Yeah. Hmm. Um, the, um, um, in, in my opinion, there is no really bad version of the Joker. E, um, each actor, um, e, e, um, either in person or, or, or voice acting brings their own unique quality to Joker that, um, that, that brings them to life in their own way. Except in my opinion, I just don't like Jared Leto's Joker. I did not like Jared Leto's Joker from Suicide Squad. I did not like him. It's it's very much a... My problem with it was, ooh, Heath Ledger went edgy. I'll go edgier. Mm-hmm. And you don't necessarily and, need to do that. Like, what yeah. made Mark Hamill work was Mark Hamill's Joker in the animated series wasn't trying to redo what Jack Nicholson had done a couple years exactly. earlier. Jack wasn't trying to... Obviously, they weren't trying to redo what Cesar Romero right. had done. Um, but they were always trying to do something new. Heath went in a completely different direction and, and embraced the chaos end of it. And Leto and David Ayers were just like, well, we can just do that, but more. Mm -hmm. And you, you, I wanted something more original to it. Yeah. Right. I mean, right. I mean it's, um, it, it wasn't just the way, the way he played it. I didn't like how, how, how they designed Jared yeah. Leto Joker, you know, covered no, in just... tattoos, um, um, of the freaking messed up grills. He, he, he looked like a, a freaking New York gangster gone, gone nutso. And that's just, it did not, it, it didn't, it didn't he, um, hit well to me. It, and it, not, it, it reminded me of like someone's younger brother of the tough guy. <laughs> trying to emulate that that like, actually my, man, my brother's really the joker <laughs> and so i'm gonna be the joker too right, right so i'm right. gonna get the same i'm gonna wear the clothes but i'm gonna be edgier and i'm gonna have more tattoos than he had because mm -hmm. i'm i'm tough too like no yeah. kid you're not you're just you, you're just not joker. and Speaking and the thing is the thing is jared leto i just want to yeah. say this i don't always love what he does in movies mm -hmm. like i just I, it doesn't always work for me but he puts a lot of himself into those roles. Sure. And he really tries things. He, tr he takes chances. I, I appreciate that. They don't always work. And in the case of the Joker, it really didn't work. But like, yeah. he, he goes places at least. Yeah. I get yeah. that. Yeah. So, I, you um, know, and I personally, you know, I, I liked what Joaquin, Joaquin Phoenix, Phoenix did. Yeah. I like what he did because, you know, for him to take that character and to make it a sympathetic character at the same time as evil. Um, that was, that was a feat, you know, in my opinion, mm -hmm. to be able to take that character that people have grown to love, to hate and all those kind of things or love because he's so evil kind of thing, but then to actually make him an actual sympathetic character that you feel sorry for by the end. And then even though he's doing some horrible things towards the end of that movie, you're like, I get it. <laughs> I can if I'd been there, I kind of might've been pushed in that direction as well. Um, it does yeah. beg the question. It does beg the question. In your opinion, is the Joker a character that could be redeemed? No, mm, mm -mm. no, no. And here's the thing: like another part of it too is not only is Jared Leto's Joker the younger brother that's trying to be hardcore, but he's the that's the version of the Joker that doesn't doesn't get it. Like misses the point of. Like took the wrong things from Heath Ledger's Joker, mm -hmm. right? Heath Ledger's Heath Ledger's performance is unreal. It's so incredibly good. It's so layered. There's so much to it. The movie is great. Yeah, but My... there's so many people that took the wrong, the wrong information from that and mm -hmm. went forward. A lot of the same stuff happened with, um, with the movie, the Joker movie, where people took the wrong. It's it's like when you uh, you can kind of. If you if you know people of a certain age and they saw Fight Club, it's a litmus test of what they took from Fight Club, because there was a, a lot of people my generation who because I was like the target audience for that. I was in that. I was 17 when that movie came out and like that was aimed at sort of my generation and a, and a few years older. 
but I knew so many people that took the wrong message from Fight Club and embraced the wrong parts of it. And it wasn't supposed to glorify the hyper masculinity yeah. uh, that it kind of did. But like at the same time, it was supposed to be a takedown of all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so you see that a lot with things. And that's why like the Joker's not he's not redeemable. There's nothing good about him because he is bringing about um, chaos and strife in whatever form it can and just causes problems because he likes causing problems. Yeah, true. I yeah. mean, this is a character in the comics that has repeatedly tried to kill the entirety of the Bat family. Mm -hmm. Not just Batman, but he wants to, he doesn't want to kill Batman. He wants to kill everyone around Batman to, to break Batman down and make him at the same level. And that's, right. Right. You know, that's the thing that Batman always has to fight. Yeah. And, uh, no, I don't. I don't find him re like most of the most of your comic book villains can have some redeeming qualities somewhere along the line. Something broke them, but maybe they can come back from it. But Joker is so far beyond broken yeah. that uh, you know it's it's like breaking a mirror where it's never going to be the same again, no matter what. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, yeah um, I just always love asking those kinds of questions, you know, because. Um, um, because if you know your stuff, and um, and Travis, you sound like you know your stuff. Props to you. I think um, it pretty well. Bravo, bravo. Um, um, if you know your stuff, it's such a thought-provoking question that can spark such a unique debate that starts as just a goofy, nerdy kind of question, you know. And mm -hmm. and I find that amazing uh, uh, about our kind of of I guess people, you know. <laughs> And um, that's why we had Travis on, so we could have some deep discussion <laughs> well, <laughs> about here's anything. The <laughs> here's the thing is what makes a compelling villain in a story, right? Yeah. Because when you, when, when you are reading a story or you're watching a movie unfold or a TV series, whatever it is, you're, you have your protagonist or protagonists and then antagonist. And a compelling, complex villain in your movie, in your story, whatever it is, should be able to have the story told from their perspective and you think, oh, they might be right. That there should be some element of that to it. Even if, like, there's the whole, there was the meme going on about, oh, Thanos was right. Mm. No, Thanos wasn't, wasn't right. His, his underlying bedrock idea was correct in that the universe couldn't sustain all of the, you know, with the, with the resources there were, the universe couldn't sustain itself. Right, right. Yeah. It's sort of... And it's that's just an extension of the fact that we as humans, basically, the, the planet is going to eventually just burn us off like a virus mm -hmm. because yeah. it can't it, it can't handle us. Um, but his methods were absolutely awful. And he had he came about it from the wrong perspective. Right. And he needed to have his perspective different. But you can there's like that that kernel of something in there that's like, no, 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 I, I get what you're saying, but maybe just a thought killing and destroying half of the universe's population isn't the way to do that. Yeah. Like, and that's what makes compelling villains is mm -hmm. somebody that you can, you can believe they believe they are correct. They believe they are right. And it's just that their methods, uh, don't, you know, belie that. And so that's, that's the kind of thing like the Joker doesn't really believe that he's doing anything right. That's what made Heath Ledger's Joker interesting was he literally embraced chaos. He got money from all of the, the different uh, crime families in Gotham and then he burned it mm -hmm. oh, yeah. because he didn't care about the money. All he Only wanted to do was cause house. strife and problems. Right. Right. Yep. So yeah. that's what makes him irredeemable is he, he, he at no point actually thinks he's doing anything right. He's just like, nah, I'm going to stir the pot and yep. mess everything up because yep. that's what I do. Yeah, um, exactly. Whereas like Ra's al Ghul, Ra's al Ghul in Batman Begins believes that he is helping the, the population and doing the most good for the most number of people. Mm -hmm. that, was, taking... that, that, uh, that was uh, that, that was Liam Neeson's character, right? Yes. Yeah. Ah, yeah. I yeah. I, I knew he was in it. I just can't remember who he played. So like that that there's your difference right there. Is Ra's al Ghul slash uh, uh, Bane in the third one. They are. They believe that what they are doing is the best for the most number of people, and that they are willing. They are the only ones willing to make those sacrifices and make those hard decisions. Whereas the Joker, in the middle of all that, is just like, nope, burn it all. Who cares? Let it watch it burn and let's see what happens. Right. And that's where he becomes irredeemable. 
I I I just realized something. Um, what's that? Um, what what, what have you realized, what does, Connor? What does John Wick and and Heath Ledger's Joker have in common? <laughs> I have what, no what idea. They, have in they both kill people with pencils. Yeah. Okay. That um yeah um yeah um, um, the one scene to see when Joker he full on full on head bangs a, a dude's head into a table and just has a pencil go through his eye and just listen uh, I, I was in I, I remember being in the theater for that moment and you didn't see that coming like you saw it coming but mm-hmm. you didn't see it coming right that was and, I mean, it looks so moment. natural I want to know how they filmed that or tricked the camera or 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 if it was just straight up editing you know just like. Like That's an CGI. Edit. Oh man, because it looks so real. Right. Like, did they really just kill that guy? Man. By the way, you want to have your mind blown? Go back and watch some old, old movies, like silent film era stuff, and try to figure out how they did some of the things they did in those movies. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. that will fry your brain when you try to mm-hmm. think like they didn't have any of the technology we have now, and like there's a shot in a movie that's a it's a impossible camera shot the camera just keeps moving forward over table after table after table it goes across an entire ballroom um there's stuff from like buster keaton films harold lloyd all this stuff and you're just like how did they do that and then when you find out it just you're like i would never think to do that you wouldn't think to do it that way today but they would use things like pieces of glass and do a matte painting on top of that and film through that Mm-hmm. to force perspective to make you think something is on is in the scene that isn't actually there hmm. like, yeah. there's all sorts of crazy stuff like that so yeah yeah there's my chicken i chased <laughs> <laughs> so one how of us one of us <laughs> bah, bah, bah. <laughs> so uh while we're talking about media stuff why don't we talk about this movie that we decided to talk decided to watch that uh, uh unfortunately oh, yeah. was not the best movie that we could have ever watch but but <laughs> i think it wasn't I th- the worst but it was definitely oh, well, not one of it was best. pretty cl- it was pretty close to some of the worst we've seen uh but anyway no, 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 no. um so let's 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 jump into the next segment of roll for credits how about that got my nitpicking glasses on and everything i will so, snoop out every single whole irreverent <laughs> irrelevant detail so, so the movie we ended up watching uh was dig a movie from 2022 um starring uh thomas jane um and um oh god what's uh what's the guy's name emil the hirsch. Guy? yeah emil hirsch i was trying to pull up his his name um, they're kind of the two big names in there. I didn't recognize anybody else in this movie, Travis. I know you're you know a lot of movies. I didn't know if you recognize anybody else in this movie or not, but those are the only two names that I recognize. Uh, no, I only recognize Thomas Jane and Emil Hirsch. I didn't. It's a small movie. There's very few characters in yeah. it. Ninety yeah. percent of the movie deals with those with the four main the, characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the the daughter in the movie, uh, Jane, who is mm-hmm. deaf. Mm-hmm. Um, is played by Harlow Jane, which is Thomas Jane's daughter. So I thought that was kind of cool. That's cool. I didn't even know that's that. His I actual didn't even pick daughter that. playing. I didn't pick that up. Yeah, it's his actual daughter playing that role. Um, I, yeah. Um, I'll let you talk a little bit more about the movie. Well, you know, I mean, the, the 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 premise of the movie, and and this should give you an idea of the quality of this movie. That the 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 plot summary on IMDb is actually wrong. It's not even actually yeah. accurate to the movie. So what it says on IMDb is a widow father and his daughter whose house is up for demolition are taken hostage by a dangerous couple who won't stop until they retrieve what lies beneath the property. Uh, here's the deal. It wasn't their house. Um, no, it wasn't. So, so you know, it it starts with, a tr- you know, the, the beginning of the movie starts with this tragic thing where, you know, um, Dad's kind of a jerk. Wife dies. Dad, well, Dad's kind of a jerk. Dad's kind of got a, a temper problem, and through uh, a conflict at a gas station, his wife ends up getting killed. And then um, his his daughter goes deaf because of the the gunshot near her ears, and and it creates this whole rough dynamic between the two of them. And she's she's been living somewhere, you know, for treatment and this kind of stuff. Um, so they've had this rocky relationship, but his job is primarily he goes in, people hire him to demo houses and, um, and, and do stuff like that. And so that's kind of the setup for the, for the thing. Um, 
And then what happens is that he, you know, he's sitting at his at his shop, and Emil Hirsch's character comes in and says, "Hey, I got a job for you. I've just got this 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 house that." Um, and he gives him this this big cover story. He says, "You just need to go in. I just need to get something out of that house before it gets demoed, because you know, there was a whole split up between my brother and his wife, or something like that." And so it sets up this thing where um, Thomas Jane's character and his partner, his his help, are going to go in and demo this house um, so that they can get this stuff that that Emil Hirsch's character needs. Um, and then it goes south really fast from there once they get there. So that's kind of the setup. Um, you know, anything you guys want to add before we kind of talk, go further into the movie itself? I will say uh, this. Um, uh, the movie did surprisingly well for for what little cast they had. The main cast was essentially just just those four people, the dad, the daughter, and the crazy gun-toting couple. And it did a decent amount of telling that story of setting up that tension with only those four core actors. Uh, so it- so, so I, mm. I, I will give them those kinds of props. <laughs> Go. Go Travis. Okay, so we, Go Travis. We, we, we might have we, we might have some disagreement here. A hundred percent. We're going to have I, disagreement on this. <laughs> I I am a fan of small stories, right? I love when a movie. Yeah. Like I I like big stories too. I love you know big world changing events, but I I really enjoy when you know a director and a writer um, can get a small cast, put it in a very uh, isolated area, and just tell a quick little story about people. Um, you know, there's a there's a great movie. Uh, from 2003 called identity with john cusack and um it all centers around just a group of people at this hotel in the middle of the desert at one night it goes in a very different direction um which is weird but but it's like it's that small scale thing so i like that the problem here was the story is just there's nothing there there's no Mm -hmm. there's no reason that emil hirsch and uh, Victor and Lola need to hire this guy to go do anything to the house. Mm-mm. There really isn't a reason for that. There's no reason for them to hire them to go out to the house and then show up hours later and cause all sorts of problems. Because that's just going to make it that much more difficult for them to do what they want to do. Um, there's no, there's really no reason. Like They give us a reason that Thomas Jane and uh, and his daughter have the the problems that they do but it's done so quickly and it's inconsistent like at Mm -hmm. one point early in the movie there um the woman that uh was watching jane is like hey you need to learn the sign language and communicate with her and all he's doing is writing stuff down but yet he can understand her sign language just fine and he even shows at points that he can sign yep so it's like okay is that a thing or is that not a thing you've got the the two um you know victor and lola who are they get along but they fight all the time but they have like he's a hothead but then he's the one that's that's trying to he's he's not the big bad guy we're we're supposed to somehow feel some sympathy for him and that she's the one that pushed him to it it was just so wildly inconsistent and it felt like a couple people had a script and some money and said we're gonna make a movie but, but you know actually, that, 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 that. But the thing, the thing that I thought was interesting was, you know, when we when we tried to do this podcast a few weeks ago and had all the audio issues, we just kanked it for the night. You and I, were, Travis, you and I were talking afterwards, and you said, you know, it's interesting when you have a movie this small that there are six production companies listed in the credits at the beginning of the movie. It's like, you know, if you have six production, yeah, if you have six production companies for a huge, say, Marvel movie, okay, that's one thing. But for six production companies for a little teeny movie like this. Somebody didn't want to foot the whole bill for this thing, <laughs> and they were shopping for money. Yeah, they were. Yeah, um, it, it it amazes. Like, I always expect there's going to be one or two production companies and like somebody distributing it. Okay, fine. Yeah. And the bigger the movie, the more of those you're going to get because nobody wants to foot the uh, two hundred and fifty million dollars for a movie. Yeah. But th- this was a uh, a movie this year or last year mm-hmm. that was made for. Uh, I don't even know if they have the budget listed anywhere um but it was not much and i I did i saw like four production company names at the beginning i'm like let's that's a bad sign already starting out yeah we're not in we're not in good company here and it just 
the movie to me never could figure out what it wanted to be. Yeah. Like, did it want to be, did it want to, it wanted to be a thriller, but it never really gave us much in that Mm -mm, end of things. Mm -mm. And it wasn't going to be a big action piece. Um, You know, at one point, Tom Jane and his daughter, like, get to go get away. They make it like a half a mile and they get lost because they're in the middle of the damn desert. Right. It's in the middle of nowhere, Texas or some Texas or Oklahoma or something Something like that. Yeah. (laughs) It doesn't really matter at this point. Um, I I didn't care. Like, (laughs) he's such a he's such an unlikable character in that opening scene where he you know i get being the protective father that's fine that's a good character trope to go for he's going to find his daughter at the party and he's gonna throw her like a sack of potatoes over his shoulder and carry her out of the party okay cool but then he goes on to be just a jerk on somebody who cut him off and then he doesn't stop when they get to because the same guy pulls up after him at the gas station that was the strange (laughs) thing to me so that doesn't make any sense so it's, uh, I don't even think it's Maybe the same truck happen. at that point. Yeah. Like at, um, my guess is that wasn't even the same truck that cut him off. Yeah. And he just yeah. was looking for an argument. He was, lo- he was looking for a reason to fight. So I don't, I'm already starting off the movie, not liking this character and he's not giving me much to like him throughout the rest of the movie. No, even there was no redeeming Jason quality. And I yeah. Should. Yeah. No. Yeah. There was, there was, there was no redemption arc in there anywhere for him at all i mean he was just he was you know yes he saved his saved his daughter but he was still a jerk through the whole thing there was no redemption he was at still all a bad dad he so a bad dad. you know yeah. i mean and yeah and the random kid that was squatting at the property that they get rid of and the movie forgets about him for 45 minutes and then he just happens show to show back. back yeah and he's he's literally brought back into the movie to give us a character that can get killed and yeah, because killing off a character is the quickest way to create drama in your story. Right. But it should be earned. You know, the reason that uh, like Infinity War from Ave- the Avengers Infinity War works is all of those characters at that point, you care about them. We don't know who this Tommy kid is at all. Yeah. So we have no reason to care when he just suddenly shows back up and is like, hi, how you doing? And I get shot and I'm dead. It's like, we okay, didn't know Pablo uh, either. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was almost like they, they, they said, okay, we got to create this tension with this guy, this, this guy that was squatting mm-hmm. in the house. But we're going to get rid of him. And then the writers went, oh, wait, we got to, we got to do this thing. Like you were just saying, we got to create this, 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 this thing. So we got to bring him back. But there was, there was no real explanation or, or, or rationale as to why he would have ended back up over there. there you know, there, there's right, nothing there. Whatsoever. Yeah, it, they it, tried um, to give us a, a like a love connection between him and Jane, some flirtation. Yeah, but that's not enough for this dude to come back. No, like, he's he's gone, and you've never you never see him again. Or you know, better better yet, just don't have the character in the movie mm-hmm. because he has no connection to our main characters at all. You know, I it think... could have been if if he had been somebody that was somehow connected to Jane prior, and exactly. there was a connection there, and maybe Tom, you know, Scott. Tom Jane's character doesn't like him, but he's like, in the, you could create some sort of a connection there. There's none. This character has no connection to the story. He's just there to be cannon fodder, and it's it's a waste. I it's mean, unearned. It, yeah, yeah. I th- I it would have reason why. I th- I'm go, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going. I was going to say it would have made more sense that if you took the kid that she was making out with at the beginning of the movie at the party mm-hmm. to be the kid that comes and try. He, she texts him or something, and he comes to try to save her or something like that. And that's how sure, that yeah. that makes perfect sense, right? But this was just it's some better than what they did. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, Connor, what were you going to say? I, I think the reason why the writers chose to kill Tommy was um, well, um, was because. In their eyes, they um, um, they would think us, the audience, sees him as innocent in a way. So, so, so then Victor and Lola taking a quote unquote innocent life just because he happened to be there was supposed to be this <gasps> big gasp, shock kind of I mean, thing to, to the audience, and and it I can played, see that it played to that notion for like half a second, but uh, but it didn't fully land, you know. Well, in part because they had already done that with Pablo earlier in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. 
he's yeah. he's already fulfilled that role so now mm-hmm. they're double dipping on that yeah, yeah. but it, and nobody likes the, a double dipper <laughs> all, no. all, all those germs I mean, in my guac no. this movie really re had the had the stench of first time movie all over it mm. and and that's really where it came from the the two writers uh whose names i will completely butcher <laughs> um because it was it was i believe it's banapal or uh or i don't know but uh Ablakad, it's two looks like two brothers probably yeah. or siblings well um, you get yeah it was a last name like that if you got yeah and their uh their credits include this movie and um and this movie uh that's it <laughs> they have written and produced uh this movie that's yep. all they have done yep. and you can tell because they don't really know how to pace a story the movie commits the cardinal sin of just being boring yeah yeah it's yeah. just there it's not it doesn't even go into the the realm of being so bad it's good right it's cheap but it doesn't ever look like it's cheap but it's not cheap in a Roger Corman way right it's not like oh <laughs> You're right. you know the set's made out of cardboard and it's funny because of that or anything like it just they 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 wrote it and they set it in the middle of the desert so that they didn't have to pay for uh, locations and they didn't have to have a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And that house could have been any house whatsoever. There, like the story doesn't really make any sense if he's that concerned with finding because the whole thing is that Victor, um, is it Victor? I don't remember. His I name. think uh, yeah, um, Victor I think it's Victor. Lola. Yeah, Victor. The whole thing is that Victor killed his brother and they need to find the body because they buried the body at the house and the house is going to get demoed and they're going to dig everything up. And so he's got to find the body and move it again. Now, they don't come right out and say that. And the movie tries to make it seem like they're going after money or something. Mm -hmm. Then you figure out that it's the body. But if that's the case, you're not sending anyone else out there because as soon as they find that box... They're going to know what's going on. Right. So you're going and doing that yourself. You're not sending anyone else out to do that. Yeah. Like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. And so in order to cover that up, you've got to kill those two people. So you're trying to recover one body. You just created two, well, in this movie, in this case, four more with Pablo and Tommy. Right. So you've now got five yeah. bodies you got to get rid of. Uh, it, yeah, it just... It there was no sense in in the plot line of, in, in the script pacing or anything like that. It just It just... Didn't make any sense, but you know, and I, when I saw Thomas Jane was in it, I'm like, okay, because I've seen movies that are okay, but but Thomas Jane kind of saves it with just his performances. Mm. Yeah, not mm-hmm. this one. It did it. No, not this one. I mean, he. No, he was, I mean, he's. Yeah, he's the most compelling performance in the movie. Sure, he's fine, but he his character is unlikable. Yeah. Harlo Jane, his daughter, did fine. Yeah, she, for for an early role of hers. Yeah, um, she was fine. Uh, playing kind of just the, I mean, she. It's easy. She gets to play a cranky daughter, right? <laughs> um, the the addition of her being deaf, I thought was interesting. And it, but but again, it's sort of a, it's a tropey thing to do to give us attempted story points. Like that feels like somewhere along the line, while they while the, these two were writing this script, they're like, oh oh, we need to have a scene like this. If she was deaf, we could do that. And then they, they were like, that's brilliant. We'll work that in mm-hmm. without any real other reason for it. Emil Hirsch isn't a bad actor, but he's terrible in this. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I've, um, you know, I've seen what Into the Wild, where he plays, you know, that McCandless character, you know, that, that true to life story about the guy that. Yeah, have you mm-hmm. seen that before? Uh, yes. I, I mean, I thought yes. he did great in he, that. He, he's done good in other things, but this, I'm like, dude, you did you no, just he, mail this in for a check? I mean, what, what? What happened? Probably. Here? I mean, I'm sure that's what it was. And look, I'm never gonna, I'm never going to deride an actor for taking a job and getting paid. They, right. they got to eat just like yeah. any of us. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But this was definitely one of those. You know, it's, it's like uh, Hayden Christensen gets all sorts of crap for the Star Wars movies. He's not a bad actor Mm-mm. at all. I've seen him in stuff where he's fine, but you know, those weren't. He wasn't. He was not set up for success in those. Emil Hirsch wasn't set up for success here. And whether he took it just for a paycheck. And did the Michael Caine thing in Jaws: The Revenge, or, <laughs> or whatever? Like he's good. He's capable of being good. Yeah. But the character that he's given in this is so paper thin yeah. and one dimensional, and makes the dumbest decisions. And then on top of that, the Lola character, she also seemed like a capable actor, but that character was terrible and all over the place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it. It you know. 
actors can only do so much with the script they're given. And, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. it was just, there was not much for them to work with. Excuse me. No, there really wasn't. And I'm, I'm someone who typically can find something I like about any movie that I watch. Right, right. Like, I like pretty much everything. I have no desire to watch Dig again because it just bored. Like, I was bored. It was yeah. an hour and a half yeah. long, and its pacing was terrible. It felt so much longer than it was. Yep. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I can usually try to find, even if some, a movie, like you said, sometimes we we've had movies that were so bad, they became good. Cause they were just fun to talk about how bad they were, you know, but we've had some other movies like where, Bora. yeah, we've had some other movies where we, we've both gone. It was just a bad, there's nothing to say. It was just a bad movie. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. There's nothing to talk about, you know, kind like, of thing. Yeah. And, and, and like, this was kind of one of those. It's just like, it was like, um, unsalted stale popcorn it'll fill you up but it's not satisfying at all there was i mean it just it took no, an hour and a half of my time popcorn. i like stale popcorn <laughs> it's just it, it's just an hour and a half that i'm not going to get back that i could yeah. have spent watching something much better it's it is the uh you know it's it's the cheap cut of steak that yeah. has been overcooked and no salt was used mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. it fed me but i want better and, right. and I've had better. And Thomas Jane has done better. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know the director, K, K uh, Asher Levin. Don't know at all. A um, lot of TV series and like mu straight to video stuff, music videos. So doesn't seem like a, and didn't really come across as a super capable director either. Right. Um, it just had that, uh, the whole feel of it was like <laughs> small production, no real. Um, and, and the thing about it is you can tell when there's good filmmaking talent when mm -hmm. they have a small movie. I mean, Tarantino's first movie, <clears throat> Reservoir Dogs, is effectively the same type of thing. It's an incredibly small cast. It's all set in one or two rooms. Yep. But Tarantino wrote that, and he's got incredible skill at writing, and he directed yep. it, and he's got incredible skill at directing, and it is a fantastic movie. Absolutely. Day, some yep. 30 years later. Not only has nobody seen Dig, but nobody's going to remember Dig in <laughs> yeah. a very short period of time. Because right. Just, 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 just like no one's going to remember Velocipaster. Yeah, I'm not even going to go there with the Velocipaster. So anyway. <laughs> well, that's a totally different thing because that's yep. a movie that is intentionally going the camp route. That's Roger Corman. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Corman, Corman knew what he was doing. He's like, I'm just going to make money by making the cheapest thing possible that people will go and see. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what Velocipaster is. It's it's to make a movie as cheaply as possible that can. It's um the one from. This I year love that, that you uh, knew that what it. I was talking about. <laughs> it, it means you've seen it. Oh yeah. Oh no, I've seen it. It's it's Travis. Tra yeah, Travis is the movie guy, man. Uh, come on. So I mean, there was a movie that came out this year, Winnie the Pooh: Blood and Honey. I don't know if you've heard <laughs> about that. I've heard, heard about it. Fan. No. I that was I. I heard of that, and um, and when I saw the trailer for it, I thought it was, it was just going to be some kind of weird thing someone posted on YouTube as just for clickbait. But it was it was like an actual movie. Yes. So basically, that movie was what made because the Winnie crap. the Pooh uh, and that whole cast of characters from A.A. A. Milne went into the public domain, so they no longer you no longer have to ask permission or pay for rights for it. You can't do a lot of the stuff that Disney incorporated into the character is still covered by copyright, but the actual characters themselves are not. So basically a film producer and a guy was like, well, I can make a movie with these characters. And so I'm just going to make this dumb slasher flick because it's <laughs> stupid enough that people are going to talk about it and they'll eventually see it. And I can make it for 50 bucks in a case of beer. And that's what they did. They made it for super cheap <laughs> and people will watch it and talk about it. Wow. So, but then <laughs> that, you get stuff like this, and and that's where that's what I have no desire to see that movie at all. But I yeah. get that from like a from from sort of a weird artistic standpoint of like I'm just gonna make something really dumb and cheap, and people will probably check it out. But like this, this kind of movie like Dig is, I I'm pretty sure that those those two siblings thought, oh, we've got a great script here, and this guy thought, no, oh, you know, I can make this movie, and it just it's flat. It's all yeah. it's 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 like Coke that's been left outside for yep. too long. It's just yep. flat and warm and not good. Yeah. Yeah. It, in it. <laughs> yeah. So so, you know, 
overall, there was there, I, I, I didn't there was nothing redeeming about this movie for me that would make Not me suggest all. this to anybody for any reason. Even even like sold out Thomas Jane fans, I'm like, yeah, no. You're you're not missing no. anything by missing this in the Thomas Jane canon of films. You know. Hey Dad. Yeah. Um you you, me and mom are are all fans of Criminal Minds, right? Yeah. Um the dynamic between Victor and Lola kind of reminded me of 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 the unsubs of in an episode of Criminal Minds early on on um <laughs> You expecting me to remember a specific episode? Really? Uh, um, it was. Um, um, so I'm it, loosening my neck up from the whiplash of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been wanting to say it. For you see what you see what I mean? <laughs> you see what I mean? Oh yeah. <laughs> this is how my brain works. Okay. Okay. You. you I will um, say. You, I you, understand. You <laughs> I, I do you, understand it. You. You, you you either strap on, watch till the end, Whoa. Or, 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 or or you just. I didn't know it was this kind of show. <laughs> let's, be let's be judicious with with Ooh. with using phrases like I'm strap on on dis- this show. Sorry. So, <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, so I think to wrap that that movie discussion up, it wasn't good. Nobody liked it. There wasn't anything redeeming about it. We don't Here recommend it to any of our friends. Down. So, um, so yeah, but it, that's on Rotten Tomatoes. But that's 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 what happens when you when you pick movies by rolling dice. Sometimes you roll a good one, sometimes you roll a bad one. So we'll see we'll see what we get yeah, next week. We so. roll more bad than good, though. Well, because decide, and yeah. Sometimes the fates are cruel. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, so now I think what we want to do, we want to try to dive in and try this new segment thing, and and you know. We call it Ever Changing Story, and I was talking at last year at Dragon Con. I was talking to Stephanie Krugnola, you know, um, and you know of um, Adventure Incorporated and, and that kind of stuff. And I and I said, "Hey, would you sing a jingle for us?" So I got so Connor and I sat and we 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 took um, the the music to um, Never Ending Story theme and yeah. wrote our own lyrics. We had and just so seen that movie. And so we we um. <laughs> So I got I got her to to sing it and then I cut part of it and so that's going to be kind of our theme for now. Um, so so here's here's the new theme for the new segment, ever changing story. Come and make up everything right here on the spot. Create it right <laughs> here on the show. It's a new tale for the ever changing story. Ah. Story. So it's much it, it it's much longer than that, but we just it's much longer than that, but we just took we just I just took the 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 course there at the end for for the for the jingle, but so what we're gonna I, tr- just, go ahead real quick though I have to say that was fantastic right well like ten out of ten right, <laughs> right? That's that's amazing. Amazing. No, no Stephanie's <laughs> Stephanie's jingle so. Um, <laughs> So so anyway so so what we're what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna use these things these story cube things all right and um the each each one of us we're gonna roll a twenty sided die and and the high score gets to go first middle score goes second mm-hmm. lowest score goes third um and uh, then I'm gonna I've got my nice little shake 'em up box here I'm gonna put put them in there and I'm gonna shake up the 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 cubes and then. It's going to create three rows. The person that gets to go first gets to pick one of the rows of cubes, and they have to incorporate the the the, the objects in that, those cubes um, in their their segment of the story. And then they've got at least five minutes to kind of get that stuff in. And then we switch gears, and then the guy, the second person continues the story where, where the other person left off, but they have to incorporate the second row of dice. In, in the story, and then the the sucker who is third has to somehow finish up the story using the last three objects that we have. So oh boy. we were trying to we were trying to find a way to do something completely random but give it some structure so we're not just rambling for hours. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so if you got a twenty sided die, everybody roll a die and let's see what we got. All right, all right. Um, I got a ten. I got a 10. So you and I will roll off while, while Travis gets his. Right. Oh, I rolled a 19. Wow. I rolled an 18. I botched. 
I got rolled no. a one. I botched. So, so I'm going to shake up the dice here and see what we get. So I'm going cre right. to create my little three rows here. All right. So they're kind of turned around, but see if you can see them here. So the top row is a fountain, and the middle thing is I don't know what that is. You can make it whatever you want it to be. Uh, I, see, and then, I see it's some kind of directional thing. And then yeah, there's a, like a compass rose. Yeah, and then, then a castle. Um, okay. Connor, you, you're going to have like a, looks like a kid with a monster shadow and a, a bee. Bumblebee. And then somebody and sleeping. sleeping. And then I, then I get the scales of justice, a sheep, <laughs> and a skyscraper. And right. I get to, um, <laughs> so somehow I get to end the story with those. Okay, cool. So, hmm. um, you know, just going to let, since Travis gets to go first, Travis gets to just start the story, and we just kind of see where it goes. All right. Let's do this. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So I've got, I've got a fountain, I've got a compass rose, and I've got a castle. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see. Where can I go with this? What can we do? I've got an what idea already. I, I'm sure you do. Tag. <laughs> uh, you, you probably do, but uh, but you but you got to go. For, you that's gotta right. Wait and incorporate it into whatever the hell I can. I that's right. That's right. I'm gonna make you work, boy. <laughs> um, oh, sure, uh, sure. All right. All right. So, uh, uh, a, a very long time ago, uh, there was a family lived in a castle, a magnificent, sprawling castle, and uh, they were lords of the land. Uh, that they, you know, uh, one one morning, uh, you know, every morning. Uh, dad would get up. We'll call him Steve. Uh, Steve would get up. He would stand on the parapet mm -hmm. of the castle and he would look out over his uh, over his domain, very much like Mufasa in Lion King. You know, every everything the sun touches is our our kingdom. Son, his uh, his kid was named Kevin, by the way. Kevin. Um, okay. In the middle mm -hmm. courtyard of their castle, they had an elaborate fountain, and this thing was just, I mean, ornate. It was it was the uh, the biggest show like the biggest showpiece, um, just flaunting all of their wealth, right? Uh, this stupid fountain, um, but it was also uh, it, it gave directions. It was a giant compass rose. Nice worked into the stonework of this incredible fountain. You could see, and it was accurate. They had it pointing so north pointed north, um, and uh, so. They have this wonderful fountain and this ornate thing, but they're nice people. They're not like they flaunt all of their wealth. They don't give anything out to all the peasants. The peasants live in squalor and, you know, covered in mud and barely have enough food to eat, but they, they, they're happy. Um, and, uh, and, and one day Steve, um, Kevin tells Kevin, Kevin, who is, uh, he's his son, but he's, you know, 15, 16 years old. He's, he's, mm -hmm. And he said, and he says to him, listen, boy, all of this one day will be yours, but not until I'm dead and not, and that won't happen for a very long time. And don't get any ideas about trying to kill me and take over either. <laughs> all right. Because you aren't the first boy we've had. All the others failed. <clears throat> you don't want to know what happened to them, but this will all be yours at some point. Before that though, I need you to go off on a quest and I need you to find we're missing we're missing one very important piece to this this wonderful fountain that we have here, and it's it's a it's a it's a stone. It's a very special stone that will help make sure that this fountain never runs out of water. And I need you to go to find that. And so that's all you get. It it is to the east. Have fun on your way, kid. And he gives him a little. You know, uh, a sack with uh, with some rations in it, a little pat on the back, and says, "We'll see you when you get back," and sends him off on his way. There you go, Connor. All right, I'm Connor, gonna... pick it up. All right. <laughs> All right, I actually have a really good idea for this. All right, so, so as Kevin, so as Kevin uh, departs on his journey, um, his his father and mother are 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 left in. In the advise, advisoral care of um, of the royal of the royal grander known as Jeff, but 
but little did people know that Jeff had a secret. He, um, he was, in a way, a puppet for an ancient demon, hereby known as Jack. <laughs> We're going simple names. I'm going simple names. Love so, it. The naming conventions are good. <laughs> so, so Jeff knew knew. So Jeff knew that that by royal law, if um if the heir apparent is, is off on on a quest or or journey, um given to him by the king by his father, um if if something were if something were to happen to the king that would make him unable to rule, um um the the royal grandeur um Jeff would um um would, would then become interim king until the heir apparent returned. You see see Jeff see Jack often told Jeff that that this that he would one day rule and so Jack sent out his little minions to not only monitor Kevin but to create a curse for the king. Um Jack no wait, yeah, Jack enchanted a, a bumblebee. This um um it, uh, this little bumblebee would on upon stinging the king put him in a deep enchanted sleep. Nothing would be able to nothing would be able to wake him up. Not um not a slap to the face, a punch to the balls, hand dipped in cold water, nothing. Um, so, so he sent this bee to the king, um, a, a, as he as he was one day just walking around the fountain, marveling at its beauty and, and remembering how how his father told how his father and then his father before him, each contributed something to the fountain to make it unique and powerful in its own right. And then, the bee stung him right on the cheek, and then on his cheek bee, it began to grow a large a large bump with um with the stinger of the bee lodged deep inside giving him this this little black dimple um um have have you ever seen a mole like a singular black mole with a big hair in it it kind of looked like that mm. right. and um and, um and, and then he would fall over in the courtyard asleep Jeff, um, Jeff, who was conveniently nearby, would um, would come over and call t- to the guards to and take the king to the royal bedchamber. And as Kevin was gone searching for the stone, Je- Jeff became the uh, the interim king of the land and began to put his devious desires to work. And Dad, there you go. What do you guys okay. think so far? I told you I had an idea. All right. So, all right, and so, golly, Moses, what the hell what can I do here? Um, and so Kevin, uh, you know, is on his quest, and, and unbeknownst to him of everything that's going on back at the kingdom, Kevin is out on his quest to find this missing piece of the fountain to complete the fountain so that the water will never run out. And as he is uh, progressing through uh, the lands and through the forest, he comes upon um, a strange-looking animal. Uh, it, it looks like a sheep, but it talks, and it's green. And the, the sheep says, Ho there, stop! And Kevin's like, um, You're a sheep. Why are you talking? Oh, I only look like a sheep. I'm actually a guardian um, angel for this area of the wood. And I take safe space um, shapes to not scare people that come through. And I know who you are, Kevin. And Kevin says, how do you know who I am? So, well, you're the son of the king. And everybody knows who you are. But what I don't think you understand is what's going on back at the kingdom. And Kevin goes, "What? What's what's going on back at the kingdom?" And 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 this guardian says, "Well, um, there's been a conspiracy. Jeff, your 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 king's advisor, has actually been working with uh, an evil demon named Jack, 
um, Cactus Jack, actually. And so, you know, and, and they have cursed him to eternal slumber. And Jeff has taken over the kingdom in your, in your absence, even though you are rightly to take the throne in your father's illness. And Kevin says, well, I've been given a royal charge. I cannot go back until I've completed the quest because that was given by the order of the king and the penalty for not completing quests by the order of the king is death. And my father would have to have the curse of having to kill his own son. So I have to complete the quest. Well, what is the quest, the sheep says. And he says, well, I have to find the missing part for the fountain in the courtyard of our kingdom to complete the fountain to complete the directional mechanism and to keep the water flowing eternally. And and the sheep says, well, well, I know where that is. And it's like, oh, okay. And he said, well, it's 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 in the tower, but you've got to you've got to cross the desert to get to the tower. And it's like, well, how do I cross the desert? And the sheep's like, well, you, you walk. I, what do you mean? How do you cross the desert? You walk across the desert. <laughs> and Kevin's like, well, that's not really helpful. I'm like, I didn't say I was here to help you. I just, am, I'm just here to give you information. It's that way. I can't help you any more than that. So Kevin says, okay, fine. So Kevin starts going, and he, you know, and he, and for for days and for weeks, he's crossing this desert, and, and 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 you know, he's barely staying alive. He's barely able to find water to keep him alive. But he gets to the tower. And he finds this tower, and weirdly, it looks like Trump Tower. It's got it's made of gold, and it's got a big T on it. And it's like, what is what is this? It's gonna be Edge. And so, and edge. and a man walks out and said, "Welcome to my tower. It's huge. It's fabulous." What do you need? And Ke Ke Kevin says, I just need the part. I don't even know what the part is. To finish the, the fountain thing at my house so I can go back so then I can fight the bad guys so that I can save my dad in the kingdom. Well, it's upstairs. Do you need it? Well, yeah. Okay, here you go. And so this this orange looking big haired guy, this the guardian of the tower, takes Kevin upstairs and hands him Meets with the other sharks. Scales of justice. Now the 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 guardian of the tower says the scales of justice are always not in my favor. It's always someone else's fault. But for you, maybe the scales will balance. And so he gives him the scales. And Kevin makes the trek, the week's trek, back across the desert. Gets back home. Jeff sitting up on the throne like, uh, you know, fancy narcissistic Jafar. And Kevin walks in with the scales and says, I've completed the quest. I am back, and I have completed what I have to do. And he uh, goes to the fountain and installs the scales of justice. The fountain is completed, and when the fountain is completed, the water starts to, to spray eternally, and Father magically wakes up, restores the kingdom, kills Jeff, and the green sheep shows up, and takes Cactus Jack off to the desert, never to be seen again. The end. I don't know. <laughs> I like. <laughs> no, hold on, where did Cactus so, Jack come from? I don't know. It just came out. It just came out. So it's here's worse. the thing. So okay. So if we're doing, if we do a revision of this, if we do, a, 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 you know, like first, that's the rough draft, right? We do our first revision. <laughs> So Cactus Jack, as soon as you said Cactus Jack, what I wanted was another pro wrestler. So 
<laughs> in version two of this, the green sheep is played by Randy Macho Man Sam. There you go. Right. Oh, yeah. The green sheep is the, the, green oh, sheep yeah, is brother. A, is the wrestler. Now, what I need you to do is cross that there desert and <laughs> go to the tower and deal with the evil Dr. Trump and get the skills of this uh, you may find. So, to save your daddy. anyway. So, uh, so, so then you can have a nice, we can have a uh, steel cage match between uh, the Rassilor and Jeff. There you go. There you go. Yep. For so. some reason, I pictured I pictured Jeff as being voiced by Christopher Walken. Is that weird? <laughs> Pro- no. Well, I mean, it's not. But as soon as Cact or no, I'm sorry, Jack. That's what I'm thinking of. But as soon as Cactus Jack was named, I'm like, well, all I see now is Mick Foley. So, <laughs> right. 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 Oh. Which is, I mean, that's very good. So that's. It was a gr- I thought it was good for a first effort, right? It Seeing was. as how, yeah, really I mean, and, and, and I got to tell you, it is hard being the guy in last to try to keep the storyline going with whatever you got left. I had a sheep and a skyscraper <laughs> and some scales, it, you know? So, so yeah, so that should be interesting. That should be an interesting thing to, to, to do moving forward. So we're going to, so we're, we're going to be having a, lo- a lot of different types of, of, uh, um, segment so that's one we're gonna do we've got another one we're gonna call uh, welcome to the blunder dome where we're gonna take you know people from uh media or literature or history or whatever and let myself and whoever our guest is pick somebody f- from media or history or something like that and then create a, a dungeons and dragons character based on that person um and then connor's gonna dm a battle between the two of them to the death so the first so time we tried the, the, um, the, the first time me and dad tried this um, in like our early stages of the podcast, um, I um, I had Felicity Smoke as as a half elf ranger rogue hybrid and and then dad played Attila the Hun. No, Genghis Khan. Geng- so it's Genghis, Genghis Khan against Felicity Smoke to fighting to the death. Yeah. Huh. So so, okay. you know, so but it was just the two of us. But we think it's a whole lot better if we have some of this like DMing it and kind of keeping you know, giving yeah. us some context. So, That's and some fun stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then Connor has decided, yeah. Connor's decided he's going to run like a one man campaign for me where I'm going to run a character and we're going to do like a little short one off series for like a month kind of thing. So we're just yeah, trying some new cool. different kind of things. Um, and instead of just the movies and the, and the, the nerd questions that we used to do. Yeah, so we're trying to of TBD. Yeah. TBD, That's whatever, we'll whatever. My guy. Call it. Yeah. Uh, one fun thing that you could also do. Um, and it's not an original idea, and it, uh, there is a uh, TikTok account that does this already, but uh, pick up a copy of The League of Regrettable Superheroes. Uh. It's a book that is just full of completely random superheroes. And uh, there's a great series on TikTok where a guy, he's a total comic nerd, he does his weekly, not weekly show where he picks a character at random out of that book and just runs them down. Wow. And if nothing else, it can give you some fun kind of talking points. Right. To right. Go over is like some yeah. of these just crazy things that got like two issues of a comic book. Like how did this ever even get published type of stuff? Mm-hmm. Um, and the book, I think the book's only like $25 if you want a hardcover yeah. of it. Or right. there's probably a Kindle version. Right. Yeah. So no, that's... That, sounds, that sounds fun. I like the, I like the one man uh, campaign. I like yeah. The, oh, yeah. the literary characters, characters from history. Uh, gives me like a very kind of um, uh, what was the MTV thing um, with the claymation? Yeah, it was like and yeah, would, I know they would wrestle like that <laughs> slash epic rap battles of history. Yes, like exactly. That's of exactly that's ex- <laughs> that's exactly what I'm thinking. So, so anyway, so yeah, we're just trying some new stuff. See what happens. See what sticks. Um, but yeah. but but Travis, um, I so appreciate you coming on with us and and doing this. Um, and, and of course we're going to have you back at some point for, to do other things too, but before, but tell us where we can, where everybody can find you because I, you know, you and I met through Legion of Dorks discord and I've been on your yep. podcast. So, Hello, so tell us, tell us where folks can find you and what you do. Easiest place to find me is, uh, at my website, tvstravis.com. Um, it's got links to all the socials that I'm part of, which is almost always TV's Travis, but it's also got links to the shows that I do. I'm part of four concurrent podcasts right now. (laughs) Um, one is on a hiatus, but three others are still currently going And the, and the fourth one, let's watch Highlanders coming back. Right. Um, 
I do. Uh, I, I talk a lot of movies, television, whether it's uh, gore is all horror movies. Um, Let's Watch Highlander was just Highlander stuff. <laughs> very, very focused. Um, my main show is called Wait, You Haven't Seen. That's what you've been on. Yep. Um, yep. And it's movie discussions, but it's always somebody's first time seeing a movie. Yes. So like coming up this week, I've got somebody who's never seen The Fisher King. Wow. And I can't wait because I love Terry That's Gilliam movies. List. Yeah. And it's it's Terry Gilliam, Jeff Bridges, and Robin Williams all involved in the same project. It's fantastic. <laughs> right. And he's never seen it before. I can't Anything wait to Robin talk Robin Williams is instant gold in my opinion. Yeah. Anything yeah. with that man. And then the other one is, so, what's the other one? Uh, those were the days, the days which right. I do with our friend Stephen from the Legion of Dorks, Audie, uh, yep. and Amy Frost. And we talk about classic television on that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've also got a YouTube channel that I'm starting to put content up on. I'm working on my first series for that uh, where I'm diving into franchises. Nice. So I am going to be watching uh, all of the Fast and Furious franchise um, this summer. Okay. Well, of which I, gonna, going into this project, a good day or two. well, and going into this project, I've only ever seen the first movie. Yeah. Uh, and wow. nothing else. Yeah. I've seen so, the first two. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I've never so seen that's, any of them. <laughs> Yeah, that's some stuff I'm doing. I'm also on Twitch. I stream okay. on there quite a bit. But yeah. tvstravis.com is the easiest place to find. Okay. Because everything consolidates Everything's there. there, yeah. You know, and, and I was surprised that I brought up a movie to you uh, a, a few weeks ago um, that at the time you hadn't seen. You may have seen it since then. But True Romance, that you, I think you said you had never seen True Romance, right? I that... haven't. And it's it's a big blind spot for me because, oh, like, dude, I mean, I like Tarantino my stuff and he wrote it. And it's got so many people in it that i like and for whatever it no came out what just early enough that i wasn't seeing those movies yeah. yet it was yeah a couple of years before i started seeing a lot of the tarantino-esque things yeah and then it just sort of never happened so yeah. that's that's one that's on my list though as much as much as i love gary oldman um Every time I see him, and no matter what I see him in, I can't help but hear him speaking in the voice of the character that he does in True Romance. Man, it's one of the most distinctive characters I've ever seen him do. Oh, yeah. It's so good. I so, mean, he's just one of those actors that just yeah. becomes whatever role is. It's funny because one of the reasons I love Gary Oldman is he does that, but he's not a method actor. Right. He he goes into character and breaks out of character in between takes, and it's amazing to watch because <laughs> he's just got that much ability he doesn't yeah. have to be daniel day lewis and make people carry him around on set right his character can't walk yeah yeah but so no so, in, so anyway so i i really appreciate it i thought this i had a blast i was nervous going into this because i'm not as creative as you two are with this stuff and so i'm sitting here going i don't know if i can keep up with them on this stuff so, but I, but it was, it was fun. I really had a blast doing this with you guys. Um, you and, started out good. Well, you know, and then it just kind of petered out because I didn't know how to end the damn thing. So, well, anyway. Endings, endings are, to stories are hard. That's the yeah. hardest part. That's yeah. why Monty Python, uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus always just had, and now for something completely different. Yeah. Because... Why write the end of the sketch? They can just stop and move on. I had right. the easy part. I got to start everything. Yeah, so exactly. I was, that's what I I'm was saying. A whole cloth. That's what. That's what. That's why you want to get that high roll on that first die. So, um, but yeah. So, so we're here Friday. You know, we're going to get back to our regular schedule Friday nights at seven o'clock, um, and uh, we're going to be doing this uh, here. We put the stream up after the stream's done. I'll eventually put it up on YouTube, and then of course, you know, just find the podcast itself. Uh, anywhere you find podcasts, um, you can find me on on you know at Head Gamer on Twitter um, and um, Instagram and Gene Pool Variety Hour on Instagram, and so we're there. But um, we're really trying to just get this thing kicked back off the ground, and I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, give us some feedback, um, good, bad, or indifferent, just to help us get better at what we're doing. Um and thanks again, Travis, for coming on, and we'll definitely have you on again some other time. All right, and no, Connor. So, and... go ahead. Wait, what? What'd you say? Oh no, uh, no thanks for thanks for having me on, and uh, and yeah, I'll definitely be, I'll definitely come back. Right, and so and so it. that's all we got for tonight. We'll be back next Friday night doing the same thing. It's gonna be just me and Connor next week, just kind of doing our normal thing. Um, and we'll, we'll I, be working I wonder on what I'll be thinking about next. Week. I have no idea because it'll change five times during the episode. So, but anyway, <laughs> so y'all have a good night. Thanks for coming in. And Connor, always remember. 
Stay nerdy, my friends. still here? It's over. Go home.